fantastic. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Hi, everyone. I'm Akila Radha Krishnan with the Global Justice Center. Um, I'm just here to briefly welcome everybody on behalf of the co-organizers. So thank you so much to our co-organizers at Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, and of course, the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative for convening this important conversation. Um, just so you know, um, please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. And when we move into audience Q&A, we will be pulling those questions together um, and offer um, some time for interactive conversation. And with that, I'm gonna actually turn it over to our very able moderator, Richard Goldstone. Um, as many of you know, Richard was the former chief prosecutor of the ICTY and ICTR, and as well a judge on the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Richard, thank you so much and over to you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for inviting me to moderate this, uh, this panel. And I think most most of the people on this uh, Zoom Zoom webinar are aware that the Crimes Against Humanity initiative began some years ago. In fact, in two thousand and eight, when a meeting was convened at Washington University in St. Louis by Professor Lila Sadat. Uh, Lila has remained creatively and tenaciously involved since then, and is one of our esteemed panelists today. The initiative was launched uh, in 2008 in the recognition that all atrocity crimes, apart from crimes against humanity, are the subject of international treaties, the Genocide Convention, the Geneva Conventions, and also the Torture Convention. An international convention on crimes against humanity is a crucial missing element in the framework of international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and international human rights law. After many meetings with many experts from many countries, the International Law Commission of the United Nations took up the treaty and in August 2019 unanimously voted to send its draft convention to the General Assembly with the recommendation that the GA itself should, should elaborate a convention, or alternatively that it should be elaborated by an international conference of plenipotentiaries. Since that reference to the General Assembly, the draft convention has languished in the Sixth Committee. The Sixth Committee has an arcane rule to the effect that all of its decisions require consensus, and thus a fairly small number of countries are able to, 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 to hold up the whole process. Eventually, on the 18th of November of last year, the Sixth Committee resolved that within a two-year time frame, there should be an exchange of substantive views on all aspects of the draft articles including two intercessional resume conven convenings of the Sixth Committee at an interactive format in April 2023 and in April 2024. So the first of these um, meetings from April the 10th to the 14th of this year, two weeks ago, the UN Sixth Committee held the first intercessional meeting. This webinar brings together experts who have closely followed these developments, as well as the April 6th committee, the, the, the April 6th, 6th committee meeting. Uh, um, they, they uh, our panelists, will highlight key developments and challenges during the 6th committee session and discuss ways to advance the convention, including further improvements to the draft articles, including in, on sexual and gender-based crimes. So our four panelists are in alphabetical order. Richard Dicker, Senior Legal Advisor, Human Rights Watch. Hugo Rilva, Legal Advisor, Amnesty International. Dr. Christine Ryan, Legal Director, Global Justice Center. And Professor Leela Sadat, the James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law at Washington University School of Law and Special Advisor on Crimes Against Humanity to the ICC Prosecutor. After we've heard from the panel, uh, as, as Akila has, 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 has mentioned, uh, the, the members will be requested to respond to questions which, you, which we have received from you, our audience. I turn then to the panel. All four of you were present in person and followed the Sixth Committee's resume session two weeks ago in New York. It would be great if each of you would give us your impressions of the resume session and your key takeaways. We would love to hear your views of where the project will go from here. Let's start with you, Professor Leela Sadat. Leela, you have been the moving force behind this draft convention. You've been following the conversations on the Sixth Committee since 2019. Can you reflect on how the recent resumed session, a couple of weeks ago, compares with previous Sixth Committee meetings on the draft articles? Leela, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you to Global Justice Center for providing support for this webinar and to all my co-panelists for being here. Uh, and Richard, your leadership has been really important in this area as well. So when I think about this last resume session, no one, I think at the outset, knew how it was going to go, actually. There was a question mark about what would states do? Would it be productive? Up to now, we had had mostly technical conversations about whether we could or could not even move this process forward. Um, fortunately, I think we had a very substantive discussion and a groundbreaking discussion in, in terms of the working methods of the sixth committee. It, it reminded me a little bit, Richard, of it. in 2019, when the ILC draft was introduced, many states actually commented on the text. They had read it, they had studied it, they'd been engaged in the 2013 to 2019 process. But many other states had gotten the ILC report late and didn't just, they didn't really have the bandwidth to comment on it. And so they didn't, and they just said, we needed more time. And unfortunately in 2020 and 2021, um, we still had a, a, a shutdown essentially of working methods because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Civil society could not get in uh, in 2021, even though there was substantial support. And so what I really found heartening this time was we had a combination of civil society engagement. We were all able to be present. We had a meeting in March that was um, supported by Germany and France, convening all UN member states as well as civil society there to kind of break open the draft and the commentaries and start discussing them substantively. And so while there were still delegations, I think, uh, this year that were a little bit uncomfortable with the with sort of the the, the nitty gritty of the text because it's quite a complex instrument. Um, I think they were really able to engage. And one of the really, as Switzerland said, one of the really cool things about the meeting was they had this new format called mini debates, which the International Law Commission has when there's sort of a point of order, somebody wants to engage uh, on a specific topic, then the members of the commission can speak to each other, essentially just focusing on that particular issue. And so the co-facilitators decided to introduce this idea of the mini debate into the conversation uh, at UN headquarters, taking a bit of a risk because with potentially 193 states, that mini debate could have overwhelmed the process. Um, but I think I'll, I'll leave it to my other panelists to, to sort of talk about what they drew from that, but I thought it was a good process of engagement because delegations weren't they weren't shy about raising objections or simply saying that we don't understand what we're doing here. Why are we doing this? Um, do we have to take the ILC draft as it is or can we renegotiate it? So um, I'll just finish by saying, you know, everything old is new again. The process that this draft treaty has gone through for 15 years is essentially restarting and restarting with a new set of uh, delegates who are in New York, who are now taking a really hard look at it. So I found it um, encouraging to see the level of substantive engagement and the fact that the room was full for an entire week. So I'll stop there. Richard, you're on mute. You know, I think you might have frozen. Yeah. yeah, no, it's um, my apologies. I'm going to come in here and step in for Richard. He's got load shedding in South Africa. Um, and he was afraid that that this may happen. So I'm just going to briefly step in. Thank you, Layla, for um, kind of setting the stage here. Um, and as we wait for Richard to join, oh, I think he might be back. I think he's coming back, yeah. Except you have to oh, unmute. You're on mute, Richard. Oh. 
I think he may be frozen again. Why don't we go ahead and maybe move forward to the next panelist, um, just to kind of share some reflections and hopefully uh, all the load shedding and electricity issues sort themselves out for Richard. So, Christine, um, you know, the Global Justice Center has, you know, sees this treaty as a key tool in the fight against sexual and gender based violence. And in the recent session, what role did gender issues play in the debate? And how do you assess the opportunities for gender justice moving forward? Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Akila. Um, it's great to be here um, along with my co-panelists. And just to take a, a step back for a moment, um, for those who are new to our work at the Global Justice Center, you know, we do see this these draft articles as having a significant potential impact for justice for gender-based crimes. And the draft articles, they have a relatively robust codification of a range of sexual and gender-based crimes. And this would make the proposed treaty an, an essential tool going forward. It also captures gender-related harms that are excluded from the existing frameworks on mass atrocity crimes, uh, specifically the Genocide Convention and the Geneva Conventions, including the crime of gender-based persecution. So we, that's part of our main um, entry point into this process has been thinking about how this treaty um, can be useful and important for advancing gender justice, but notwithstanding you know, the many merits that are in the draft articles as prepared by the ILC, um, we have been, and many states as well, have reflected on the fact that you know perhaps they should be modified in certain respects. And we saw this at the Sixth Committee last week in, um, in both progressive and possibly regressive ways. So a number of states issued supportive statements regarding the removal of the outdated gender definition that had been imported um, to the, an earlier draft of the draft articles by the ILC imported from the Rome Statute. And we saw a number of states welcome that move. Um, and that as well to, um, for those of you who are members of civil society, that move came from advocacy from civil society. So shows how important our role in this process is. Um, however, so just to say, you know, the good news first, we heard like Mexico, Canada, Peru, Portugal, Belgium, Brazil, Australia, Romania, the US, Sweden, New Zealand, Malta, Sierra Leone, all say positive things about gender in this treaty. Um, some of them spoke beyond the definition, um, welcoming the definition to talk about the need to change uh, definitions of the crimes, which again had been imported um, almost identically from the Rome statute, you know, with the exception of the gender definition. And we were particularly heartened to see states call out um, the issue of forced pregnancy and also perhaps the need to codify forced marriage and Sierra Leone as well to talk about codifying enslavement. And another aspect for us thinking of this as a, a treaty that we want to have impact as we consider the prevention elements of the treaty and we were very heartened to see a number of states mention that. Um, the, this treaty is unique if it you know, comes into being in its obligations to prevent crimes against humanity. And we saw states starting to grapple with what that might mean because the provisions are at present in the treaty, they are, you know, they're bare enough, but you know, we wanted states to recognize, as we've said a number of times, that we think that a key part of this treaty is the human rights element and preventing crimes against humanity. Now, one thing that I think that we were caught off guard with was the fact that a number of states were, and quite visibly, you know, upset that the gender definition had been removed. Uh, we thought that we perhaps put that to bed by having it removed from the, the draft articles and the ILC having had come to that understanding that it's not a, um, an appropriate definition, it's opaque, 
Um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense logically, um, but many states were concerned and this aligns with what we're seeing in other areas of international lawmaking where gender is becoming, you know, this type of battleground where it need not be. Uh, we saw concerning statements from Qatar, Egypt, Cameroon, uh, the Gambia, Poland, and that is something I think that we have to calibrate in our strategy, thinking about the opportunities for gender justice going forward. Uh, and there were also, of course, you know, a number of issues that didn't come up, um, that could have come up from states. Again, this was, as Leila mentioned, just the first week that states were getting into a substantive discussion. So I'm, we're conscious of that, or we don't want it to seem like we expected everything to emerge this week. But going forward and thinking about our conversations with states and with civil society, there are a number of issues that we hope uh, might get more airtime and that can be part of our, our advocacy and discussions with states, um, you know, around possibly um, more of an emphasis on a treaty monitoring mechanism that was mentioned by one state. Uh, there are a number of emerging conversations about whether or not the crime of apartheid should be expanded to address gender apartheid, um, working and thinking about um, how to sensitize um, issues around LGBT rights within gender persecution, all issues that we expect to be highly contentious, um, but at this point, they are things that we can consider and see where the, the continue to see where the temperature is among states. Um, I can take more questions later on, but I think for the, the time being, I can uh, pass it over um, from that introduction to, to what we saw last week on gender. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you very much, Christina. I, I do apologize for the earlier glitch and, and will now again revert to, to Hugo Relva. Uh, Amnesty International Hugo has been engaged with the process from the very start, prior to the ILC drafting process even began. You have personally been involved in making so many constructive submissions on the terms of the treaty. Please share with us your views on how the draft was dealt with during the resume session and the opportunities there are in your view to further improve the substance of the treaty. Hugo, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard, and good morning, all. Um, first of all, Richard, I would like to express uh, Amnesty International gratitude to the Global Justice Center for convening this uh, webinar, this explanation of what happened two weeks ago in New York. You, you said what opportunities there are for further improve the substance of this treaty. I think, Richard, it's plenty plenty of opportunities. First of all, one very immediate in, in the weeks to come, which is the diplomatic conference that shall adopt the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty on Genocide, Crimes Against Humanity, and War Crimes, among other crimes under international law, um, which in its text contain a number of provisions that are all repeated in the Crimes Against Humanity Convention. For example, Christine, you know that uh, the definition of gender has also been abrogated in the Mutual Legal Assistance Draft Treaty. And the definition of victims in this uh, other treaty follows one of our recommendations, which is Rule 85 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence of the International Criminal Court. This is something that we are planning to raise, you know, the are uh, encouraging states participating in the diplomatic conference to also be vocal in the draft convention on crimes against humanity. Um, by the way, because I know it is a concern of some people, we are truly convinced that the mutual legal assistance does not collide at all with the draft convention on crimes against humanity. On the contrary, they go hand by hand. And uh, another opportunity that we foresee in, in, in the future, I don't know if I should say that, but you know, states 
do not normally accept any article, guideline, principle, rule, etc., coming from the International Law Commission without making amendments. They, they wish to have their own fingerprint. And uh, even though the, the draft convention on crimes against humanity as it is today, it's a, it's a very positive starting point for states to, to consider on a potential treaty. We think that there are a number of provisions that could be enhanced, could be improved, with perhaps sometimes with small amendments. Um, I'm after the two after the, the session in New York two weeks ago. I should say that I'm glad because there were quite a number of delegations present in conference room four, and an average of between 40 and 50 states in each of the five clusters discussing the, the substantive provisions of the treaty. Uh, for example, one key provision for us, which is the prohibition of crimes against humanity as a peremptory norm of international law, use cohens, has been supported by the vast majority of states. I, I think the, the only exceptions I remember were Russia and China, which objected that. Uh, the definition of crimes against humanity contained in the draft convention, it's, it's very good since it covers the vast majority of possible crimes against humanity. However, we are of the view that international law has evolved in, in, in some ways. And for example, we, we share the abrogation of the definition of gender. I think, Christine, the only states uh, objecting that were Qatar, Nigeria, and Egypt, if I'm not wrong. And uh, we are glad because we, we saw Portugal, Italy, and the United Kingdom questioning the definition of persecution. You remember that in the draft convention, as well as in Article 7 of the Rome Statute, persecution could only be committed if it is along with another crime in connection with the second crime. And uh, we do not share that view. We think that persecution as in customary international law should be an independent crime, an autonomous crime. And the same applies for the crime of enforced disappearance, which unfortunately contain at the end of the definition, uh, an expression like uh, that the deprivation of liberty should be for a prolonged period of time. Fortunately, Portugal, Argentina, Colombia, Canada, and Peru objected that. So I think there is a chance for further improvement of the convention on, on this question. Uh, the non-applicability of statutory limitations was supported by several states, among them El Salvador and the Philippines. And Austria was very clear in, in, in saying that the, the prohibition should be um, amendment in a way that uh, perhaps being more self-executing and not this complicated wording that Article 6 contains. Uh, we think one delegation at least were of the view that uh, the non-applicability of statutory limitations should also apply to civil tort suits or other claims for reparation, which is something in our view that should be adopted. Uh, the obligation to prosecute or extradite audedra judicare has been widely supported by a number of states. Uh, we are glad to hear the Colombian delegation uh, suggesting the Rule 85 as a possible definition of victims in the draft convention. And uh, my own country, Argentina, uh, was opposed to amnesties and military courts for trials for crimes uh, against humanity. Uh, what to improve, Richard? I think that uh, I have a number of chats with legal advisors present in the room. I very often had the impression that where some of them were acting on their own initiative, and I think capitals, this is a treaty really very, very important to be just in the hands of legal advisors in New York. I think capitals should be truly involved. Uh, and I think we, we at Amnesty internally have a, a role to play our local sections in a number of states should be more involved than in this first session. This is something for us to correct. I also think that uh, the NGOs participating in this resume session were mainly from the global north, and this is a mistake. The global south civil society organizations should participate 
in these sort of meetings. Uh, without them, you know, the, our view of the convention will be truly partial, and this uh, this should be amended. And something for our own consumption within Amnesty International is that uh, there were some questions raised by, by some delegations in this meeting and, and a month ago in the German mission meeting in New York uh, that I think that we, in the, we Amnesty International in the future could publish some papers answering some of the questions raised by a number of delegations. One of the uh, the question I still have in my mind was raised by several delegations about the question of the hierarchy among the various bases of jurisdiction. So which state should go first in a case of extraterritorial jurisdiction? Uh, yeah. I'll stop here, Richard. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Hugo, for that for that in in interesting intervention. I, I turn now to our, to our fourth panelist, uh, uh, Richard Dicker. Richard, you have also been intimately involved in this whole process, and you've engaged with a number of the states. The co-facilitators of the resumed session emphasized that the purpose of the session was to create a venue for the exchange of views on the substance of the draft articles. It would appear to many that the normal sessions of the Sixth Committee failed to do that. Do you think that this goal was met? And what do you think of the prospects for state engagement in the upcoming sessions in October and, and, and the second resume meeting in April 2024? Richard, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, and first, uh, as others have, uh, Richard, to you uh, for taking the time in uh, leading this discussion. Very, very grateful to you for doing that and to my colleagues at the Global Justice Center, as uh, uh, Leila Sadat has said, thank you very much for putting the time and effort into organizing this webinar. There is a lot to discuss. Um, my takeaway uh, from talking to uh, admittedly supportive delegations, delegations that are committed to moving this process forward, was that the discussions the week of April 10 to April 14 increased their sense of the possibility to move forward to negotiations uh, and a treaty uh, and um, uh, the importance of such treaty in providing the means to prevent and punish widespread or systematic murders, rapes, tortures, and the like committed as part of a plan or policy by a government or organization. There has been, from my conversations after our one-week session, enthusiasm in the form of delegations wanting to convene meetings to discuss what the next steps might be in pushing this process forward. I would say, Richard, that this has to do one, with the actual satisfaction of these legal advisors in the sixth committee discussing substantive matters. Uh, I think there was a real boost uh, in spending a week discussing substance as outlined in these draft articles. And I would add to that perhaps even a bit of overconfidence from some of the more supportive delegates who were questioning uh, perhaps opposition from some of the most obstructionist states as a result of that one week discussion uh, may become more muted uh, and drawing the conclusion that uh, uh, the week's discussions 
actually made opposing moving forward to negotiations and a diplomatic conference more difficult. Uh, so those are some initial findings from conversations with delegates uh, that I've had and, and certainly plan on having more. But I wanted to speak to the importance that I heard from some of these delegations. Um, they, of course, expressed it in terms of giving national courts strengthened tools to prevent and punish the scourge of crimes against humanity. One of my takeaways is the tools it will give us as civil society activists to press governments uh, to take the steps according to their own national laws uh, to prevent and punish these crimes should they occur. Um, and I would say, you know, particularly uh, um, Article 12 of this draft treaty um, with its provision on uh, victims and witnesses was so striking to me because I heard some delegations stressing from the floor wanting to make this a victim-centered process. And having worked on these issues for years, uh, to hear that language, that emphasis on victims and survivors was truly heartening. Of course, there was opposition to that, questions raised about the number of steps governments ought to take in making this treaty a victim-centered process mm -hmm. on the national level. But to my ear, it was really uh, a, a very positive development and one worth fighting for uh, as the process uh, moves forward. And finally, uh, without getting ahead of myself uh, or our discussion, I did want to pick up on a panel, the uh, point rather, that Ugo made a moment ago, that, that if we are going to move forward, it will require a world wide engagement of civil society groups uh, to take this up both to bring their experiences to the negotiating table and make the process meaningful for victims as well as to press their own governments. I'll stop there and just say thanks once again to uh, all co-panelists uh, and you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, Richard. While, while, while we're waiting for uh, questions from, uh, from our audience, let me first say that it's wonderful to hear optimism uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the resumed hearing. It may be guarded optimism, but, but there, there is optimism coming from, from, from all four of our panelists, and that's, that, that's wonderful. Uh, Richard, you, you, you referred to the importance, uh, an important role that, uh, that is now left to, to, to civil society. And my, my question I have to, to you and the other panelists is that with the draft articles having languished really in the morass of the UN Sixth Committee for the last few years, there's been limited civil society engagement with the process. With the resumed sessions, as well as the state's written comments due at the end of this year, do, do you see opportunities or prospects for civil society engagement with the current process? Why, incidentally, is civil society participation important? Richard, you've already, uh, you've already in a way, answered that question, but, but any, any, further, any further thoughts on that would be much appreciated. Certainly. Um, well, I think, um, you know, <laughs> before the session, for quite a while before the session, 
we, I mean, all of us on this uh, uh, panel were not quite clear if we as civil society were going to even be in the room. Uh, and I think ultimately, through some twists and turns, uh, we were in the room. Uh, we had, as we always uh, do, uh, easy access to delegates. Um, and I would say in answer to your question, Richard, that there is really an open opportunity for colleague organizations who see the stakes here as being as high as they are. And I'll say this is the most important human rights protecting and international criminal law strengthening uh, opportunity out there for years to come uh, that will be unfolding uh, uh, in the future. I think the door is open uh, to engage both with governments at the national level, which is so important in putting pressure uh, that will translate into support for improved provisions as Hugo uh, was enumerating, as, as Christine was enumerating as well. So the door is open. We will be in the room. We can tell governments that we will be there and they need to engage. Uh, and, and without being re redundant, I think it's the experience that civil society has working with victims that really needs to infuse and inform uh, that provision of this draft treaty and so many of the others. So uh, I don't think without that, uh, we will emerge on the other end with the kind of treaty that's needed. I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Richard. A any of the uh, other three of you want to add anything, Leela? Thank you so much, uh, Richard. And um, I'll just add just a couple of thoughts to, to what Richard Dicker said so thoughtfully, as always, um, which is I literally had delegations telling me that our educational function was important. So in addition to sort of bringing in voices of victims and survivors, which so many CSOs can do, um, while the draft articles are only 15 articles long, the commentaries are over 150 pages. And so we actually were present in March in performing an educational function, which is, you know, reducing this to two pages or 10 pages in the way that CSOs are able to do. Um, the other thing delegations tell me is that the emotional support that they receive, just the, the fact that there are organizations and individuals that are committed to them, this makes it easier for them to do what is, you know, sometimes a, a difficult job. Um, so I really hope that civil society gets engaged. And, and the final thing I'll say, just in case we don't get back to it, is every treaty is a product of its time. And when our project, Richard, if you remember, we were just a few years after the 9-11 attacks and there had been a huge debate about whether or not uh, acts of terrorism on a widespread or scale could be crimes against humanity. I think that had been a conversation around um, that. There had been debate in the scholarly literature. And so we actually had in our book, a chapter on terrorism. If I was commissioning or starting the project today, it would be environmental crimes, right? Because I think we, we sort of asked and answered the question that crimes against humanity needed to move away um, from terrorism as a separate category of offense with its own issues. Um, but there are other crimes or other phenomena that have developed in the 25 years since Rome was negotiated. And I think civil society brings those perspectives to the fore. 
Um, what Richard said, finally, I will we'll say this is a big process. There are 193 member states. It is a United Nations treaty. Uh, it will be a United Nations treaty. Let's speak positively that they'll take that great decision in October 2024 to go to negotiations. And that means that there's a lot of states that need to be engaged. The other thing about civil society is it makes it transparent. And so one of the things I, I don't see a function where I can put things into uh, the chat that some of the links that we can share, but all of this, the statements of delegations are public. The tabulation that my organization does every year showing, you know, the hundred states supporting at this point, that's all public information. So I think civil society should definitely be engaged uh, for all of those reasons, education, new ideas, new initiatives, and the uh, emotional support that the delegations need to actually be able to do this work. Good. So, thank you, Lila. The questions are beginning to come in, but 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 before referring to them, I, I have one question I'd love to hear some some response to, and that is the 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 large part of the conversation around this Crimes Against Humanity Treaty has focused on aspects related to individual criminal responsibility, the criminal aspect, and it's it's, it's perceived widely as an international criminal law project. However, if one looks at the draft articles, they lay the, they lay the foundation for a much broader objective. States' obligation to prevent and punish crimes against humanity, sure. Uh, in this way, though, the treaty is as much a human rights treaty as it is an international criminal law treaty. Is there a need to shift this conversation away from ICL to human rights, both in order to engage a broad range of states and civil society on its importance? And can these human rights considerations be used to strengthen the substance of the treaty, for example, with a treaty monitoring body, an idea that was raised by a number of states? I, I invite one of the uh, uh, panelists to respond to this, I think, important, important issue. I can jump in, um, Richard, if that's OK. And I, sure. I, um, I expect Richard Dicker to have a, a comment on this, too. Um, he's been a a great thought partner for the Global Justice Centre and a great teacher in thinking about this. So we do think that the human rights obligations within the treaty should be foregrounded. And that's both a for a, a process perspective and for because of the substance of the treaty. Um, crimes against humanity are distinct in that they can happen in peacetime and during armed conflict. And that raises for any human rights organization that is on the call, a whole range of um, grave and systemic actions that are can be not necessarily remedied, but that there is there can be accountability for them within this treaty and prevention obligations. I'm thinking, for example, um, about you know Human Rights Watch's recent report on the Shakos Islands, um, thinking about indigenous populations, thinking about cr um, crimes related to the slave trade, a whole range of human rights abuses that have historically gone under the radar and that we are, as a community and as the ecosystem of human rights organizations, we are paying more and more attention to. And I see a huge possibility for organizations who are looking for accountability for those types of abuses to see utility within the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. Um, to get to the point around a treaty monitoring body, you, you know, within the, the UN human rights system, there are a number of takeaways with regard to how to effectively use one of these monitoring bodies, but it could be so useful for the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty because as Richard mentioned earlier, we're talking about national level implementation. And there is data to show how engaging with treaty monitoring bodies in the human rights context, when states, you know, every, 
it periodically are forced to report on what they've been doing to um, prevent human rights abuses, what they've been doing to redress issues, that over time they become socialized towards human rights norms. In addition, it's a way for and provides a forum for civil society engagement um, periodically, you know, every three, four years. And it could be a fantastic mechanism to think about implementation of the treaty going forward. Now, of course, we're thinking about advancing the draft articles, you know, over the next two years. But because we're so committed to this process, we want to lay the ground for the long term. We see this as uh, having a potential to impact justice for decades to come. And that type of work needs to happen early on. And we think inserting provisions into the draft articles with the view to them becoming part of the treaty, doing that work now, such that we are ensuring civil society participation for the long run, that we're ensuring review of states' commitment and their implementation of their obligations. To us, it's a, a no-brainer if you are really thinking about the opportunities for justice with this treaty. Over. Thanks, thank you, Christine. Hugo, you have your hand up. Yeah, Richard, you, you pose a, a very good question. You know, but for me, Richard, it's not so easy to distinguish between human rights provisions and international criminal law provisions. You know, when, when you read uh, the, the Genocide Convention 70 years ago, it's without, there is no, no norm on human rights law. But today, if you read the MLA draft and the draft convention on crimes against humanity, it's plenty of provisions like the one on victims' rights is a classic today. Nobody's going to discuss. We are going to discuss the extent of, CV, of victims' rights, but not uh, itself. No refoulement, the right to consular assistance, which is an individual right today accepted in nearly all, all conventions. Regarding monitoring body, I would like to chat with, with Richard separately because we at Amnesty have uh, some reservations on that. Some people are working uh, at the UN in Amnesty, you know, it's not so uh, convinced of creating a new body with the same budget that the UN system. So I'm not saying no, but we, we want to think it uh, twice. I think we, we have time, as well as another key provision, which is settlement of disputes and the question of a possible reservation to that mechanism. So those are issues that we are still reflecting on. I hope we, we have enough time to, to, to reach a conclusion soon. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Hugo. Uh, Richard? Well, um, thank you. I uh, wanted to uh, build on a couple of comments Christine made a moment ago um, in terms of the human rights uh, safeguards uh, and and uh, uh, applicability of uh, this treaty, taking on board, uh, of course, Hugo's point of a moment ago um, about uh, the line between human rights and and criminal enforcement not always being uh, hard and fast. But what strikes me uh, from, from our work at uh, Human Rights Watch is seeing more and more effort on marginalized populations. Um, uh, Christine mentioned indigenous uh, peoples and uh, certainly those who bear the greatest brunt of human rights violations by their respective governments uh, are so often the more marginalized, uh, weaker, discriminated against segments of the population. And I think uh, this treaty will reinforce not only civil society's uh, uh, ability, but also government obligations to protect those who are at enormous risk 
um, in these challenging times. So uh, I'm I'm optimistic in terms of what human rights benefits um, uh, will emerge from this treaty. And I think as always our responsibility as civil society is to make these provisions meaningful and accessible to the populations most affected. And I think we'll be able to do that um, um, on a treaty monitoring body, uh, just to give it a little spice here in terms of our own discussion regarding uh, Hugo's comment of a moment ago. Um, I heard some interesting ideas in regard to a treaty monitoring body um, uh, along the lines of giving it some capacity uh, building and assistance role so that states that uh, become state parties and then go about the work of incorporating the necessary domestic legislation into their own law get, if needed and requested, some assistance from a group of experts. Uh, I hadn't heard that before. I thought that was well worth uh, considering and looked forward to future discussions on this. Good. Thank you, Richard. I think we should turn now to the to, to the questions we've begun receiving from from our audience. Um, the the first question refers to the fact that Germany and France are the co-facilitators for the April 2024 intercessional uh, meeting, and the question is which which states which other states have expressed interest in leading discussions. In other words, have, have, do, do we have any champions out there? Leela, what is, what is your feeling? Um, well, there, I should probably correct a, a misperception, which is that Germany and France co-hosted a session that was an informational session a month prior to the session. They weren't actually the co-facilitators. That was um, Iceland, uh, Guatemala, and I'm blanking on um, the third one. Remind me, Richard. Bangladesh? Uh, no. no, Malaysia. No, Malaysia. Malaysia. So the, the technical facilitators are actually the co-facilitators of the draft are the individuals who are uh, elected to do so within the six committee apparatus. Germany and France took it upon themselves to actually just host this informational session. The other state that's obviously emerged is Austria that's offered to host a diplomatic conference. Austria did that in 2019 and it reiterated its commitment. That's a big expense. So the United Nations uh, likes to hear that there's a state willing to step up to the plate to actually provide um, those facilities 100 states from a large co you know cross regional grouping supported the resolution that kick started the substantive process that we have now so that tells us that there are 100 there were in 2022 100 states on record including small island states the eight core group of states included lebanon uh, costa rica united states united kingdom uh, Mexico, uh, another big champion of the treaty is Portugal. The European Union has been very supportive. Uh, several African states, including the Gambia, the Gambia and Mexico were actually the two states that were the movers of the zero draft resolution that began uh, the process that we are in today. So we are seeing cross-regional support. That said, it could obviously be much stronger. Um, Sierra Leone has been an historic champion. Korea has been an historic champion. So we're seeing very, very broad support, but obviously there's still a ways to go. All right, so th thank you, Lina. Then, then uh, Richard, you want to come in? Just very quickly on the heels of what uh, Layla said, and I apologize for taking the floor again, but one takeaway I have is the importance of 
leadership from the global south on behalf of this movement. And um, in the context of what Leila just said, I think the, the states that were out in front last fall that accrued or gathered that large number of co-sponsors, Mexico and the Gambia. Uh, and they were backed up by a core group as Leila accurately described them. But to me, going forward, I think we need to look for and encourage champions from the global south uh, because of the experience those states bring to the issue and the credibility that they have in advancing this. Right. Well, let's move on. A couple, a couple of questions, either directly or indirectly, um, bring into the uh, bring into the discussion the question of the of the role that the Rome Statute played, and particularly with regard uh, to to the definition of crimes against humanity. Uh, Gorky Tata of the Budapest Centre. Um, ask why we, we suggest that we should organize some webinars dedicated specifically to exploring the views of those countries which oppose the treaty or have critical uh, critical voices, as he puts it. He says the webinar should go at the level of experts instead of uh, in, instead of the uh, uh, simply the official views of governments. Uh, that the webinar should go in the spirit of dialogue. Uh, rather than the confrontation, as I understand his question. And he says the Budapest Center would be happy to facilitate the organization of such webinars uh, or uh, uh, dialogues. And, uh, and, and we know from certainly from, from what I've read uh, of, the, uh, of the recent um, uh, uh, committee, uh, uh, the recent meeting in this, uh, uh, the recent meeting uh, in, the, uh, in the Sixth Committee, there were countries that objected to the definition being lifted from, from the Rome Statute. And, and, and some even suggested that this was sort of some back backdoor entry uh, in, uh, into the Rome Statute. So, so the, the, the issue is really, what do you do about the, 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 the naysayers, the, the, the country that really object? How do you engage them? Yeah. Any, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I'll, I'll go first since no one else is. <laughs> I was right. waiting for somebody else to jump in. Um, so one of the things, uh, the, the question is a fair one, right? And the, uh, let me just take it in two parts. In terms of the naysayers having the opportunity to engage um, and be present and engage in dialogue, uh, the informational session that it was live, so people had to go in person. It wasn't a webinar, but the March session that was hosted by France and Germany was completely, shall we say, um, it wasn't agenda driven. It was seen as here are the draft articles, here's what's in them, and then all states could take the floor. Um, and so there wasn't sort of uh, a rule that you had to support the, the treaty or offer uncritical uh, comments in order to participate. And that was true as well in the Sixth Committee. There were a hand, there were about 10 states who spoke uh, that raised various uh, objections. Um, some were more fundamental in terms of we don't, there are about three that say we just don't need this at all. And others have various um, uh quibbles with it or or concerns about it. And I think that the Sixth Committee is a place that all states can be heard. But I think it's great if the Budapest Center, which I'm not familiar with personally, wanted to organize even more informational sessions. I think everybody would really welcome that because the idea is for this to be a universal instrument. In terms of the Rome Statute, I think that's a really interesting question, Richard, and other may others may have thoughts of it. It was negotiated in 1998 amongst 165 states. Um, 
And it is the first time we saw in a major multilateral treaty, a definition of crimes against humanity. And the negotiations were difficult because unlike genocide and war crimes, there was no treaty. And so the Rome statute became the first treaty definition. We had statutes. I suppose you could say the Nuremberg Charter was a treaty, but it's so old that it, was, it wasn't it was considered appropriate anymore. Um, 120 states voted for it at Rome. 139 states signed the Rome Statute. We now have between 123 and 128, depending on the year and the situation that are under the Rome Statute. So it was taken as the platform in order for the horizontal mechanism, the interstate treaty, to be compatible with the vertical mechanism. And that was certainly the point of departure for our project. That was the point of departure for the International Law Commission. And the International Law Commission didn't even remove the definition of gender in its 2017 first reading, states asked it to remove the definition, which is why it was actually in response to states that that definition came out. So now there is an opportunity for states, um, both states parties to the Rome Statute and states not parties to the Rome Statute, to talk about the definition and say, um, what are the risks of amendment? What are the opportunities for amendment? And I think that conversation without prejudging the outcome of that conversation is absolutely on the table. And we heard that conversation happening in the sixth committee because finally states could get involved in the substantive discussion. And I think I'll let others talk a little bit more about that. I, I would just say when we started our project, there hadn't been a single case decided yet under that definition in 2010, right? We didn't have a single case and we don't have a whole lot of cases even now. So we we really have a definition that, that is out there that's being incorporated, but over 40% of Rome statute states don't even have a crimes against humanity statute in their national law. So I think that is one of the reasons that we are we are having the conversation without prejudging the answer. Well, can I ask one one question? Were there any suggestions from from the countries that that objected to the Rome Statute definition? Were there any suggestions from them as to how the definition should should be changed, or what's wrong with it? There's one state that believes the armed conflict nexus should not have been deleted, and that that's all I can really, and that's China which still argues that crimes against humanity can only be committed in armed conflict. I suspect they will not prevail in that in that conclusion. I don't think that, I think that's an outlier um, ever since the Tadic case from your tribunal uh, and even before. So that is one clear um, concern. I think most of the other um, tweaks that I've heard or proposals would be more towards the progressive side adding indigenous groups, for example, to the category of protected individuals explicitly under persecution, for example. That would be uh, an amendment to the Rome Statute definition. It wouldn't harm the Rome Statute definition, but I would see it as uh, a, a progressive step. And it was Australia, I want to say, in the session that we had in March that talked about the disabled and, and, and indigenous populations. So that's the kind of tweaking mostly that we heard. What about this? What about this? Do we need to revisit the policy element? My guess is states will say no, <laughs> we like it. Um, but I, I think those are the kinds of things. But China clearly wants to put the armed conflict nexus back in. That's the one um, to the point about mm. what are the naysayers saying? That's what they want. Okay. Thank you, Lila. Hugo? Richard, my, my two cents. Uh, Turkije also insisted, as in the past, that the attack should be widespread and systematic yeah. against any civilian population, which I don't think it is shared by too, too many states. And if we bear in mind that all instruments, all treaties, all you know resolutions setting up new ad hoc tribunals, like the one in Sierra Leone, Kosovo, Cambodia, etc., all of them follow basically the Rome Statute definition, and and it was odd for me to 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 listen to the Russian representative in the six uh, in in the resume session objecting the definition of crimes against humanity, but I I remember that Russia was or is a signatory state of the Rome Statute, so they accepted 
the the text at first and now they are reconsidering the definition so i i mean, honestly speaking i i'm not aware of any other definition of crimes against humanity substantially different from the one accepted by two thirds of the un member states mm -hmm. I might jump in um, as well, Richard, just with two quick points. And I think it, one of them will get to another question that is in the Q&A. Um, just to say, first of all, you know, those of us who are on the call, we all we want is more groups to be involved in this work. So it is fantastic to have an offer of collaboration with the Budapest Center on Preventing Mass Atrocities. We will make ourselves available for discussion, um, but what you know we see others as eventually you know taking a leadership role on this work, and that's crucial. Another thing to say in terms of states that you know have or delegations with opposing views, you know some delegations are silent and they're not participating, and it's not because they have opposing views, it's because their delegations at the UN are very, very small, their advisors are overstretched, they are following numerous committees and did not have the time or the mission didn't have the capacity to send a, a legal advisor for a full week to discuss crimes against humanity. And we've seen this consistently in New York with small states with very small missions who sometimes are reliant on, you know, very, very capable students to follow, um, follow debates for them, but not to um, establish that state's policy on the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. And we see that particularly, you know, think about some of the small island states who are playing a massive role in driving forward international law in you know relation to climate change so we do think that they can be engaged uh, but it's important to note that sometimes the silence doesn't um, signify opposition it's just that there is an important role there for civil society and some leader states from the global south and others to really support those states in terms of their engagement. And that is why we hope to really expand our engagement and the network that we have working on the treaty. That is precisely what um, those of us who are here on the call want and need. And, you know, I'll, I'll drop, you know, maybe our contact details into the chat, because if you're interested in thinking about how to engage directly with states in the next couple of months. We've mentioned that states can make written submissions this December. So before that, they will certainly welcome um, written submissions from civil society. They've welcomed everything we've provided them with. Even states who don't agree with everything that we provide, they're happy to be getting materials because they are so overstretched, so busy. There's so many things going on. And they want that information and educational element as Leila said. We've been in many respects, you know, pleasantly surprised after some worries about civil society being excluded from this process, but we're here now and we're not going away and we want more and more members of civil society involved. Thank you, Christine. Richard? Quick point, which is to underscore um, the importance of all of what Christine just said. Um, uh, for this process to move forward, civil society partners all around the world need to step in. Uh, there's no question about that. And um, uh, that was the driving uh, uh, rationale behind doing this webinar. Uh, and there are opportunities um, uh, for civil society partners to do that. For example, in addition uh, to the session that will be taking place uh, next April, um, in October of this year, the Sixth Committee will be debating uh, 
crimes against humanity. It won't be adopting a new resolution, uh, but there will be a debate and for governments to hear from organizations uh, on the ground in the uh, capitals uh, or from the countryside prior to that uh, October debate, as Christine was saying a moment ago, uh, would have resonance um, uh, with governments that are indeed looking and are open to input. So there are many different opportunities for engagement and those um, are so needed uh, to move this process forward. Oh, thank you. Let me move on to a question that comes in from our friend, uh, David donat Catin. He, he says, the public meetings of the resumed session were available on the UN webcast, and I was able to observe them. The informals were not broadcast, but were open, uh, but were open to you. Did you note any difference in the tone and content of such informal debates vis-a-vis -vis the open ones? Were delegations with opposing views open to change their starting positions? During the mini debate, my impression is that some obstructing delegations were using these opportunities to challenge the positions expressed by the like-minded delegations who prepared the statements and were on the speakers list. Thank you. Well, here's a, a political question from 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 uh, an experienced insider. Any any yeah. any comments on 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 what is a difficult question? I may just uh, so David, we were not able to go to informals. <laughs> we were excluded mm -hmm. from the informals. Um, we were able to be in the room during all the plenary discussions that you were able to observe as well. I'll let my my colleagues talk about what they perceived. I I I was told by a couple of delegations, uh, sort of like minded delegations, that they were actually giving the floor more to some states um, that were speaking often, either in opposition or, or just being a bit, maybe one could say contrarian uh, during the negotiations, because they felt it was important for those states to feel that they were heard. And they felt that it was actually positive. And so they actually, to your point, Debbie, they were kind of pulling back on their own interventions to give more of a floor um, to the states in opposition, because those were the states that they were trying, they weren't really trying to convince each other that they, they wanted to go forward with the treaty. Um, that said, there was at one point a slight concern that those um, outbursts, sometimes that they were, could have derailed the, the week, but they didn't. I think it was a very healthy, I don't know if others felt the same. Um, the other thing, just to second something that I think Ugo and Richard and Christine all said, is states are actually, most states, once they learn about this, are, are very positive, and many would like opportunities to show leadership on this project. So the UK is one that's really emerged as a leader on gender. Um, and I think finding uh, to Rebecca Schutz question, how can you get in engaged is, you know, preparing a position paper, sharing it with states, encouraging those states to champion uh, certain perspectives, I think is a real opportunity here for, um, for uh, civil society in, in this process. Yeah. Any any further comments from the other three? <laughs> well, if not, let me go to what what is the last question, and I think I think a very 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 useful uh, final question from from Rebecca Shute. She says, "Thank thank uh, th thank you for this this edifying uh, and encouraging discussion." She said, for those of us in civil society organizations, how can we most strategically support the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty movement through advocacy? What, what advice, what encouragement do you have for those out there who haven't got involved thus far? Richard, I, I come from the Global South. Uh, in my impression after chatting with a number of legal advisors in New York, 
uh, the vast majority of uh, states participating were small or medium-sized states, which has one legal advisor in New York dealing with 1,000 different items and questions. It's a, it's a separate question for big powers who have enormous team of legal advisors on each and every item. For them, it's uh, I remember one in particular saying, your paper is useful for me because you provide me the tools. I'm free to agree or disagree with your suggestions, but you are providing me some ammunition that I could uh, bear in mind. I think that uh, if a civil society has, as I, as I think it's normal, um, see that there are some provisions which are weak in the draft convention or regressive, position papers, as, as Leila mentioned seconds ago, are super useful. And the work should be mainly be done in capitals. So where, where instructions are decided and sent to New York. So this is something, and, and as I said before at the beginning, you know, we at Amnesty are reconsider part of our strategy with sections uh, to reinforce those in the global south uh, to, you know, in a way to influence the way that the instructions are sent to, to New York. I think it's plenty of opportunities, as I said at the beginning, Richard. Thanks. Thank you. Any, thank you, Hugo. Anything? Anything further from from the others of you before we before we end? Well, Alila, I just wanted to clarify the timeline that we're talking about because I it, I think it was a bit my fault. I should have said it at the beginning. So the resolution in 2022 provided that there would be this one week of resume sessions in April, which is what we just had. And we've developed some positive momentum. It then goes back to the sixth committee during its regular um, you know, legal week. And there'll be a very short uh, debate, I think there, Richard, we don't really know what exactly that will look like because they're not debating a new resolution. They have a two-year resolution. Governments have until December 31st to submit comments. And so this is this year is the window during which if, if people want to be engaged, they should be engaging now. It then goes back to the Sixth Committee for a second resume session of six days. It's a bit odd. It's sort of one week plus one in April again of next year. There will be another uh, session hosted and hopefully a lot of events before then uh, talking about it, airing some of the different issues. So we expect more intensity next spring when it comes back to the Sixth Committee. And then in October 2024, there is supposed to be a decision that's actually taken by the Sixth Committee. Um, now, there's some, like with all resolutions, there was something for everybody because it was a consensus resolution in uh, the fall of 2022. It's not clear whether states will have to vote to proceed to a diplomatic conference if that's what they want to do, or whether we can get another consensus resolution from the sixth committee. So we still have a tremendous barrier in October 2024 of um, getting past the consensus practice of the sixth committee. We know that a, a large majority of states wish to go forward, but there are uh, this handful of states that don't quite vociferously. And if things proceeded by consensus, that could in 2024 derail the process again. So I just wanted to kind of set out that time frame. Thank you, Nina. Richard, would you like the last word? Uh, well, I did want to just weigh in, um, coming off of Rebecca's question. Um, I mean, it's, it's really crucial to understand that, um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have as civil society what we had in regard to the uh, International Criminal Court Rome statute process. That is a coalition of groups with a secretariat um, uh, to communicate with partners all around the world. Uh, we are not there at this point. Um, uh, one thing that perhaps we could do is take um, what Layla just conveyed uh, verbally, put that into a written uh, calendar uh, with a line of explanation and circulate it to everyone on this uh, 
call just to give a sense of timeline. I'd also think that it would be valuable to hear expressions of interest in being engaged in the process uh, through October, November 2024, which, uh, as Layla put it, is the really going to be the moment of truth as to whether or not the process moves forward or gets stuck on that sixth committee carousel of going around and around and around with no result. So it would be interesting to hear that from uh, anyone uh, on this call. Uh, and um, we from our end will try to uh, see how best we can keep interested partners informed and, and take it from there. Good. Well, thank you very much. And it, it remains me to, to thank our panel for, for really an excellent and interesting discussion, uh, to, to thank the audience for, for good questions that, that were to the point and, uh, and, uh, and interesting. And, and in conclusion, to, to, to warmly thank uh, Akila Radhakrishnan and the Global Justice Center for having organized this, uh, this webinar so quickly on the heels of the meeting before the sixth committee. So Akila, over to you to close the proceeding. Thank you so much, Richard, for, for kind of guiding us through this discussion. Thank you everyone for joining us. I think, um, you know, Richard Dicker, you put the, the point of this webinar perfectly right in your summation comments. We're really looking forward to engaging with further civil society. You know, in this last session, it was, this group of people you're seeing on the screen with a few others who are sitting in the room and monitoring. And so really happy to continue to engage, happy to share further re reflections. And please do reach out if you want to engage and collaborate. You know, we all think that this project is incredibly important and there is a time bound moment for all of us to think about how to engage to make this project real. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to your panelists for our time and we will hopefully see you all soon. Bye-bye.